I want to talk to you about the theme for this month, January, but we have kind of a dual thing going on because we're also um, on a 21-day time of prayer and fasting. Let me encourage you to join in on that. If you don't have a, a journal here called A New Era, you can get a copy of this journal on the way out. They're $10 for a journal. You can get the, uh, an electronic copy by just downloading it online. Uh, you can get a printed copy at the house. Just download it online to your printer and uh, print it. And you'll get a, something that looks like this. If you have a, an iPad or an iBook, you can pull it right down into your iBook on your, on your device, your phone or your iPad, your computer, and it'll work just the same as a hard copy. And those are nothing. Those are, those are free, so just pull it down and, and enjoy it. Overcomercc.org. Overcomercc.org. And, you'll pull down the journal. Uh, the theme for the month is, this is, a, this is a great house, and God wants to, to build great things. God is a great God. And when God touches something, it's, it has a, uh, a flavor of greatness in it. You'll always find that theme. It may not start great, but it'll finish great. If you're going to finish great or start great, and you have to choose, don't choose to start great and finish weak. Choose to start weak and finish great. All right. So God's designed it for you to prevail and get stronger as, as things go on. That's good. Yay. Praise God for that. And so we overcome together. So, so in this house, the characteristics that we'll talk throughout the year, there's 12 characteristics that God is establishing in our house. And it's not just us physically, but it's also us physically. May God establish in you physically and emotionally all the things you need to overcome. And not only in this house spiritually, but also in your home, uh, in where you dwell, where you work, the things that you do. May it be in you physically, in your household, but also in your heart. Part of your house is you, the physical body you're in, but you're more than this earth suit. This earth suit will go back to what it was created from, and then you will move on and receive a glorified body. May in that house, you be strong and mighty. In a great house, there's profound love for God. You're not ever going to find a great house that doesn't demonstrate this profound and deep devotion to the living God. In a great house. In your house, there ought to be love for God. There ought to be some flavor inside your house when you step in and somebody new visits your house, they need to say or feel, whoa, what's up with this house? Because the love of God is in the house, the joy of Yeshua. You can't live in a house full of conflict and confusion and antagonism and, and anger and language and shows that are perverse and magazines and junk and that be a great house. That house is fighting against itself. But in a great house, there's mercy and compassion. In a great house, there's forgiveness. In a great house, there's resource. In a great house, there's sacrifice. In the great house, it's not your way, it's God's way. In a great house. Make no mistake about it, you're not going to build any house that's enduring that becomes great and, and long-lasting without it built on the principles of the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's good. Here's what Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. In a great house, there's great love for the living God. You ought to establish that in your house. You ought to make that one decision. I'm in, in my house, this house, we will serve the Lord. It may cost you some things and some, some uh, friction in some relationships as you're turning the wheel. Turn it anyway. There may be some folks that have some habits and behaviors, namely you, <laughs> that you're trying to get rid of and drop to the side. Let the love of God come and prevail and help you do that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, But know this, hard times will come in the last days. 
Don't, don't be shocked by hard times. Hard times come. People say, well, when is the last days? We are in the last days. But we have been in the last days since Jesus died on the cross and risen from the dead. The last days didn't come because of a, of a global depression or World War I or World War II. The last days didn't come because of a pandemic that started in China last year. The last days have, been, have come since Jesus said it is finished. I have done the assignment I am sent here to do and redeem the world because God would not allow us to suffer forever. So he had to send a remediation, a process to redeem us. So he sent Jesus. And once Jesus finished the assignment, the last days began. And God began this process to bring us back into a full relationship with him as sons and daughters. So that the, all the drama of life and corruption could come to an end. And it's coming to an end. Amen. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be worried. If you're born again, you have overcome. If you're not, you have a good reason for drama in your heart. But you can change that. You can turn that around by saying yes to Jesus. Know this, that hard times will come in the last days. For people will be, now watch, he's going to give us some descriptions, see if you can identify a, a culture that we live in. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents. Sometimes people say, well, I'm grown now. They're still your parent. I'm, I'm, I'm a grown man myself. I honor my mother. My natural mom passed uh, when, before Jeremiah was born. But my mom is Derzette's mom. She thinks it's Derizette thinks it's her mom, but she's really my mom. <laughs> she might have gave birth to Derizette, but she's my mom. And uh, I take care of her. When she, I check on her. I bring her stuff. Um, I pray for her. She prays for me. You, you ought to honor your parents. He said, well, you don't know my parents are bad, crazy people. They do some, some wicked stuff and love them. Burn up all that junk by loving them, by caring for them, by nurturing them, by speaking life to them when they're not even with you. You might be there across town, living someplace else. You ought to be in your house saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless my mom and my dad. Your relationship with your father may have been junk, bad, and have produced some bad things inside of you. Release those things and bless your dad. Because in the last days, men won't bless their fathers. Girls won't bless their mothers. But we do. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. You ever met somebody like that? There's irreconcilable. That no matter what you say or what you do, they are not acquiesce. They'll not say, I'm sorry. They'll not give up. They're always going to be some level of tension because they're irreconcilable. They won't reconcile. They won't, they won't have peace. It's never enough. I never get it. There's not, I, it's, it's, not, it's always something. If they want five and you give them 10, you, they're rejoicing. They say, why didn't you give me 20 then? I'm wondering why I gave you anything. but lead with love. Slanderers, without self-control. Watch this next one, brutal. These are the last days. 
There's people who are just brutal. There's, just, there's some bad things, and we make some mistakes, but to be brutal is an, a spirit that's an antagonist that is so strong, it, it's never settled till you're crushed. Without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Here's what Paul says, avoid these people. This is the last days. These are people that, that operate in a way that is just counter to the things of God. And uh, you don't have to point them out. Just make sure you're not it. The first person you should, you should measure is the person you see in the mirror. Measure that guy. Is that guy living this way? Because it doesn't do any good to go to somebody like that and tell them, hey, you know what, I've, I've been watching you and you're a lover of money and you're boastful and proud and, and demeaning and you're disobedient to your parents. You're like, you're going to hell, man. Uh, you're ungrateful, unholy, unloving, un irreconcilable. You are not, it's not going to be a good outcome. <laughs> it's not. Because they're going to grow into brutal anger, frustration. You don't need that drama. What you need to do is to go pray for them. Go stand in the gap in the spirit for them. And ask God to do something that only God can do. Because God is a lover. And in our house is profound love for God. For among, for among them, watch this now in verse 6. This is a good, a good understanding. For among them are those who worm their way into the households and deceive gullible women overwhelmed by sins and led astray by a variety of passions. Uh, one, of, one of the things that this spirit does is it, it, it bombards you with manipulation. Bombards you. Always sending something inside your house to create some level of drama inside your soul. Some little word, some little story, some little deal, some little conflict, some little agitation. You know what happened in North Carolina. You know what happened in New York. You know what happened across the seas. You know what happened in Seattle. You know, did, you see, did, did you see this? Did you see that? It's always something to turn you and keep some, something stirring in your soul. That's the drama of this life. You ought to get rid of some of those social media platforms that, you're, that you have binging your phone all the time with notifications. Hey, drama, hey, drama, hey, some drama in Chicago, some drama in New York, some drama, some, I don't even live there. <laughs> and they're trying to draw you into the drama that you can have no control over. There are going to be brutal people that do wicked things. Why do you need to know? Why do you need to know what happened about some stuff in New North Dakota? You don't live in North Dakota. It's not your family. You're not praying for the North Dakotians. That could happen here. That could happen in my own house. That could happen right over here. Stop that. It's just drama created from the last days. Let it go. Always learning and never able to acknowledge or to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. Who are these two guys that resisted Moses? Well, if you go back in the scriptures, when God had given Moses the assignment to rescue the nation of Israel from the 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and Moses and Aaron first went to Pharaoh, and said, God has sent us to tell you to let his people go so that they may worship him in the wilderness. That was the first request. It wasn't a request to say these people are going to leave forever. 
The request was, let God's people go so that they may worship God in the wilderness. And Pharaoh's response was, no. Why was his response, no? And Moses showed uh, an example of the power of God because you wouldn't come in and make a request unless there was power to grant the request and a reason for the man who had power to grant the request. So God said to Moses, take your staff and throw it to the ground. It'll turn into a serpent. And when that staff turns into a serpent, this man will see that there's an anointing and a power here. So Moses does that with Aaron. And then um, Pharaoh has two men with him. Jonas and Jambres. These are the two guys. And what they do is they, they mimic what God is doing. Let me tell you about Satan. Satan is not a creator. You are, but he is not. He has no creative ability. He cannot produce anything. He takes what is produced and mimics it. Manipulates it. Deceives it. Tricks it. He doesn't create anything. He has created himself. He wasn't created in God's image. You are. You're created in the image and likeness of God. That means you have the power to create, to produce things. You say, well, everything um, creates. No, man creates. Animals don't create, they reproduce. They produce what already is. But man has the ability to create a cell phone. I'm, I'm teaching on an iPad. I'm teaching on an iPad that didn't exist a hundred years ago. Why? Somebody created it. Somebody thought it up and produced this. And now we're using it to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Satan doesn't produce anything. He's a manipulator. And these two guys threw their, their staffs down, their sticks, and they turned into, into serpents. And so Pharaoh said, ah, see, we could do that. I'm not letting these people go. What he failed to recognize is that Moses' staff ate those other two, which was a symbol. If you don't do what I ask you to do, I'm going to eat you up. I'm going to crush you, Pharaoh. You are going to struggle. In the last days, there's manipulation to truth. And they will try to tell you certain things about life that's not true. And you stand firm and, and solid in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are men who are corrupt in mind, verse 8, and worthless in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress. For their foolishness will be clear to all, as was the foolishness of Jonas and Jambres. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, Faith, now watch these. These are characteristics that should be in your house and in your heart. The other characteristics, those are brutal, wicked, perverse people that, that you don't even know. And you cannot embrace that. There is a spirit that's going to fight you for control. You ought to allow that spirit to teach you, to talk to you about your conduct and your purpose. There is a purpose that God has given for you and for us, and we ought to operate in that purpose. Sometimes when you get older, you need to make demands on that purpose because it is the purpose of God that drives your life. Jesus came for one purpose. He was born to die, to set us free from our sins, and then to rise from the dead and sit at God's right hand to establish our victory forever. That was his purpose. And even though they tried to kill him, you couldn't kill him until he fulfilled his purpose. When he was born a baby, very at his most vulnerable place, and Herod, who is, who is the lead in that era, tries to kill Jesus. And he just slips right out of him. He's the baby. He can't, doesn't even have control, but God has control. And I'm saying there's not a situation that God is not with you, not a pandemic or a challenge you're going through that God is not already there and you're going to overcome because that's his way. Amen. 
So be at peace and follow the teaching, the conduct, the purpose, the faith, the patience, the love, and endurance, along with persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. This is Paul walking through his story. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. What I love about God, this kind of a journey with God, is there's going to be some times where stuff happens you don't particularly like or not really happy or, or good feelings. And there's not always good feelings all the time when you get born again. It's not like I got born again, now happy day, I never had a challenge. You're going to have some challenges. It's not like there's a time where now I'm saved and so therefore everybody loves me. Oh, there's some, a lot of folks that's going to hate you. In fact, there's going to be times that the person that hates you the most you have to get over is you. Because you're tired of that guy. I'm tired of that guy. I'm tired of the way he lives. I'm tired of the way he conducts his behavior. I'm tired of the way I'm sick of his giving. I'm sick of his drinking. I'm sick of his words that come out of his mouth. I'm sick of his behavior. And the guy you're sick of is you. So you got to deal with him. But you can't kill him. You got to ask God to kill him. It's like crucifying yourself. If you can get your right arm up, how do you get your left arm up? So I got to pull a spike out of my right arm and drive in my left arm. How do I, I, you never can get it done by yourself. You need some help. So God wants to do some things. He wants to, he wants to kill you. So he can bring you back to life. So we can, we, can, we can cry for the old guy, but we don't really like him anyway, and rejoice with this new guy. That reflects the Yeshua and is mighty and strong, one who loves God and cares for people. Evil people and imposters, verse 13, will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe. You know that those who taught you, and you know that they, from infancy, you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul is instructing Timothy, but he's also instructing us. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God and the woman of God, it's not gender specific, may be complete, equipped for every good work. Get ready. God is preparing you for this hour for you to overcome. And for you to bring people into the kingdom. Come on. For you draw, reach out, and bring people into the kingdom of God. This is a, a unique and powerful season that we're in. A new era has begun. And God's empowering you to, to use your voice in a variety of different ways. Sometimes you're, you're using your voice in a platform that God has given you. Use your voice to bring people into the kingdom. Sometimes God's given your voice in your closet when you're interceding and praying early in the morning where people are every place else are sleeping. And you're up praying in the spirit. Got the word open. Come on. That's your metron, your measure of rule. Sometimes you need to be functioning in that measure of rule. There's, we come and have a prayer team. How many, how many women are on the team? About 30 women praying on the team. And how many men? Ten. Ten men. Thirty women. Three to one. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. We got to step up. When do we meet in prayer? Eight o'clock, corporate prayer every Sunday in the law. All right. Also, we have corporate prayer Friday night fire every second Friday of the month. Corporate prayer at 8 a.m. here before service. And we prepare the day. Uh, then there's prayer on Fridays, once a month, 
Friday night fire, we come in this atmosphere, we're going to be here this Friday, and we're going to pray. We're going to intercede, we're going to, we're going to create an atmosphere that moves around the environment. If you're watching online, you can pray. Stand with us in prayer on Friday night, and pray early in the morning, on, on Sunday morning, and watch God do some extraordinary things that only he can do. Paul says, follow the teaching, follow the instruction. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let me close with this. I want to walk with you through an understanding of, of where we are now and what's happening. Then I'll talk a little bit about the journal as we close. But as it is, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Can we go there, guys? Thank you. Christ has been raised from the dead. As it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus is the first fruit. Jesus came with a mission and a purpose, and he did miracles, preached the gospel, healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils, and then released that, exited, and released that power into the disciples and into the body of Christ. He said, the things that you saw and heard from me, do these things. Be a copy of me here in the earth. And so that hasn't changed. We don't rally here together on a, on a morning to feel good. This is not a feel good time. This is a time to receive instruction and impartation so that we can go Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and, and Saturday and, re, and do the work of the kingdom in this metrons or the spheres in which God has given us and function because he is the first fruit. Jesus is the first one. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The Bible doesn't talk to death about death. It doesn't say that and the, those who have died. They say those who have fallen asleep. Why? Because they don't want to say death? No, they want to give you an accurate picture of what's actually happening. When somebody leaves their earth suit and this, this suit goes back to what it was created, created, they don't die. They change. Anybody that's ever been born again from, the, from Adam that surrender their life to God is alive. There's not one that has died. They have fallen asleep. When the young girl with Jesus and the family had come to get Jesus and said, listen, my daughter, she's sick and she's dying. Can you come to the house? And then somebody on the journey there, they said, don't even bother. She's already dead. And then Jesus said, no, she's not dead. She's sleeping. Well, she's dead in the term that we use, but Jesus doesn't use those terms because he's a living God and his eyes are open. So he says, she's just sleeping and let's go wake her up. And so when he gets in there, he puts them out and they ridicule him and talk trash about him and he doesn't really care. And so he gets the parents in with the disciples and he closes the door and he says, hey, little girl, get out. She opens her eyes and she rises. Because she was dead. But in his mind, she's just sleeping. When Lazarus is sick and Jesus doesn't go straight to him, he delays. He's someplace else in the south. And he's ministering the gospel. And he says, well, let's go back because our, our brother, my friend, is sleeping. And then the disciples say, well, if he's sleeping, why are we going back? He's getting better. And Jesus says, he's dead. But for your sake, it's good that I wasn't there. But now you're going to see. And he raises Lazarus from the dead. There's people that you know that, have, that have, are sleeping. Jesus is the first fruits. Just, you, you might as well walk in the truth, man, if you're going to walk in truth. Uh, I, I wear this little mask. I wear this little mask. We've got an overcomer on it. It's a nice little mask. Um, 
I don't, I don't, I don't wear this mask to protect me. This is, I'm not so afraid that I had to go get this mask. And now I've got this shield of protection. Well, I'm so much more confident now that I've got my, my, ma my, my mask on. This, this is not a shield of protection that protects you. I don't care what the world tells you. I'm not saying you shouldn't wear a mask. But the mask is not designed to protect you. The mask is designed, that's worn by a believer, as a symbol of comfort to somebody else. I wear this mask to comfort my community. I wear this mask when I go in the grocery store so that people inside the store are not freaked out because I don't have a mask on. Because they've bought into the fact that the mask is going to protect me. This mask is not protection. Jesus is protection. God protects us. We still wear a mask, but we don't wear a mask as this source that I really got to get my source together. If you were to die, you're just going to fall asleep. And we're not going to sleep. We have a purpose. And we're going to finish what we're here to do. And anytime you get into a place where your life feels threatened, you call on the purpose of God. They took Jesus to, to an edge in Nazareth to toss him over a cliff. And he passes right through him. Why does he do that? Because he can't die that way. That's not his purpose. You have a purpose. You should find it. Lock into it. Establish it. Vocalize it. And live it. For since, since death came through a man, verse 21, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as Adam all dies, so also in Christ all will be made alive. I'm going to read that again. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. First one is Christ. Jesus died on the cross. They laid him in a tomb. Three days later, he's up. The three days, he's busy. He's working. He's doing some things, canceling some sins of the past. Those Adam and Eve and the descendants that have been waiting for Jesus to come so they could actually enter into the presence of God because they couldn't go in. They were just waiting. Christ, the first fruits, afterward at his coming, us. It says, it defines us as those who belong to Christ. After Christ, then comes us. I want you to know you will never die. You may fall asleep sometime in the distant future. But you will always live. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and authority and power, no matter what power is here on the earth, that power is going to bow the knee to Yeshua. There's no power greater than God. If you want to connect to the highest power, connect to God. He is the greatest power. There is no power. There is no nation. There is no warfare, there is no technology that is greater than God. Stop worrying about the, the super bug that's going to be used to transform your minds into get a, get a grip. <laughs> it's amazing how much drama and, and manipulation that comes out during these hours. Here's what the scripture says. That, that, that God will reign and abolish all rule and authority and power for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be abolished is his death. So what are you afraid? No fear. We walk with God. And the last enemy to be abolished that will be put under our feet is death itself. So love God. And lead with love. 
When you're leading people within your metron, lead them with the love of God. Now, you, you might need practice with that. Right? Because there's a, a dynamic way in which the love of God is demonstrated and communicated. Uh, read the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. That's how you communicate this lead with love. I got I to gotta be kind. Kindness is important. Not meanness. That's the meanest Christian in the world. They should be kind. The meanest Christian should be kind. Now, listen, you, you might need some practice. So, ask, so if, you're, if you've got issues or struggles or you know, I'm the wife, and the people in the world, and that kind of deal, then ask God to give you a little practice, and he'll send a bunch of crazies to you, too. <laughs> he said, well, all these crazy people around me, God's just giving you practice. You're praying, praying for practice. You know, if you ever want to ask God for uh, patience, if you ever pray for patience, he sends you trouble. So you can practice. At this hour, practice loving. Because what never fails is love. Love never fails. You're not, you're not going to meet an, an adversary that you can't overcome when you love them. Just love them. I'm not saying you acquiesce to every desire that they have in their wicked heart. You have to find the balance between loving the sinner without practicing in their sin. If you're going to continue to practice their sin, then you're going to suffer because God won't accept it. Because he's a merciful God, but he's also just. And he has this balance between justice and mercy. And you have to recognize that God will not turn his, way on, his back on sin and say it's okay, it's not okay. He might make a, a sacrifice for the sin, but there are going to be consequences if you live a practice on a lifestyle of sin that's against God. Come on. Stop. You got somebody who's practicing that? Start praying for them that they would see the light. And you're the light. And in you, they see love. So their hearts are changed. They want to be more like you. And then you're able to lead them and mentor and train and develop and empower. And God wins. He always overcomes. Father, we just thank you for your word and it's sealed and settled. And establish it according to your way. And help us individually and collectively to lead with love. Without compromise so that we can establish the justice of God along with the mercy of God. We do what is right in your sight, yet we are compassionate and caring for your people to empower each of us to overcome according to your own design. Father, release profound love for you into our hearts and into our homes so that the love for you trumps the love that we have for self. And we become vessels of honor in your sight. In Yeshua's name, amen.